Uh, welcome to today's webinar from Physical Electronics. The topic today is Fundamentals and Applications of OJ Electron Spectroscopy. Here is the agenda for the presentation. We'll start out with a brief introduction to physical electronics, followed by a review of the history and basics of OJ electron spectroscopy, a discussion about AES hardware, and finally, a few examples of the types of data AES can provide, as well as some applications. First, a little bit about physical electronics. We are a world leader in the manufacturing of surface analytical equipment. We specialize primarily in X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, OJ electron spectroscopy, which we'll focus on in today's presentation, and time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry. Here you can see pictures of five of our most popular instruments that we sell. The company has been around for over 50 years. It started back in 1969 as a spin-off of the University of Minnesota Electrical Engineering Department. Under the instruction of Professor uh, Bill Peria, Paul Palmberg and Roland Weber developed the first commercially available OJ instrument, which led to the formation of physical electronics as we know it today. Early models, such as the one you can see here, were made from glass, which actually had to be broken in order to introduce a sample. The glass then had to be resealed before the uh, glass tube could be pumped down with a diffusion pump. As you can see, we've come a long way since then. Today, we have ultra high vacuum chambers and state of the art analysis technology. Physical Electronics has two headquarters. Our parent company is Ulvac Phi, and it is located in Chigasaki, Japan. And this is where the instrument manufacturing takes place. They also cover sales, marketing, and service for all of Asia. They have a sales and demonstration and applications lab, a large R&D department, and have about 140 employees there. Here at Phi USA in Chenhassen, Minnesota, we're the headquarters for sales, marketing, and service worldwide, except for Asia. We also have our own demo and applications lab, a contract analysis lab, an R&D department, and about 90 employees here in the US. Here's a picture of the production floor in Japan. Pictured is about half of the production facility located there. You can see dozens of instruments in various stages of production. Aside from our regional headquarters in Minnesota and Japan, we also have sales service uh, headquartered in uh, Munich, Germany at Phi GmbH. Uh, we have smaller service centers and service engineers strategically located near concentrations of installed instruments um, to provide global service and support. Now we will look at a brief history of AES. The OJ emission process as we know it today was actually first observed and published in 1922 uh, by an Austrian physicist named Lisa Meitner. She's pictured here. Her discovery was somewhat of a side effect in her greater studies on beta particles. It was then independently discovered and more extensively studied by Pierre OJ, pictured here in 1923 as the central part of his PhD work. And he is credited with the discovery by most of the scientific community today. It wasn't until 1953 that these so-called OJ electrons were identified by Lander as a positive means of surface analysis. On the left, we can see a diagram of his early spherical capacitor electron spectrometer. And on the right is a spectrum of graphite obtained from the instrument. The value of the technique seems somewhat questionable at the time due to low sensitivity. The technique was further developed in 1964 when Wetton and Harris showed that the sensitivity can be greatly enhanced by differentiating the energy distribution curve. Here you can see the spectrum of beryllium, and you can see relatively small beryllium peaks imposed on a very large background. Whereas in the derivative spectrum, we show large spectral features against a negligible background. 
Then in the late 60s, Palmberg's low energy electron diffusion or lead apparatus was used for Weber and Peria's early OJ work at the University of Minnesota. And this apparatus pictured here can still be seen in our lobby here in Chanhassen, Minnesota today. This advancement was significant because it allowed surface chemical analysis to be coupled with the more widely available and extensively studied lead instrument. Then in 1968, Palmberg and Rodin verified the extreme surface sensitivity of OJ spectroscopy. They were able to determine the OJ electron escape depth by monitoring the increasing silver signal and decreasing gold signal as silver monolators were deposited on gold. We can see in this derivative spectra that as the number of monolayers increases, the gold signal decreases and the silver signal increases. And this allowed Palmberg and Roden to get a general idea of the OJ electron escape depth. Many technological milestones have been reached since the early days of AES. The implementation of the cylindrical mirror analyzer and the scanning electron gun have brought into both the function of OJ spectroscopy and its potential applications. We will now discuss the basics of OJ electron spectroscopy, starting with a broad overview of the main characteristics of the technique, followed by a rather brief discussion of theory. AES requires an ultra high vacuum environment and uses a finely focused field emitter electron beam as the excitation source and low energy electrons or OJ electrons as the analytical signal. In other widely used surface analysis techniques like XPS, TOPSIMS, and EDS, uh, X-rays or ions are employed, but in AES, we put electrons in and get electrons out. As mentioned previously, OJ is an extremely surface sensitive technique. In the diagram, we can see the interaction of a primary electron beam with a solid surface. And though the excitation volume caused by the primary electron beam is large, the OJ electron escape depth is quite shallow, typically less than about 50 angstroms. AES can detect all elements above helium. When we look at the atomic number of elements versus their respective OJ yields, we see that there does exist an an OJ transition with a high yield for most elements across the periodic table. AES can achieve an SEM spatial resolution of about three to four nanometers and an elemental mapping spatial resolution of about eight nanometers. The example here shows a gallium arsenide aluminum arsenide super lattice with a gallium map on the left and the aluminum map in the center. If we extract line scans from these maps, we can see that we can actually distinguish a four nanometer uh, aluminum line in the aluminum map, which really puts OJ at the forefront of surface analytical techniques with respect to spatial resolution at the nanoscale. OJ can determine elemental and in some cases chemical composition of small features in thin films. Here is an example of an inclusion in carbon steel that was observed in SEM. The corresponding OJ color overlay map shows the elemental composition of the inclusion. And in this case, we can infer some chemical information as well. Finally, OJ can be used to obtain compositional depth profiles or sputter clean samples with the use of an in situ gas sputter gun. In this example, we have a 60 nanometer silicon nanowire, and you can see in the SEM image. The surface spectrum obtained from a point on the nanowire reveals the presence of phosphorus on the surface of the nanowire. And then a depth profile from this point shows the phosphorus signal decreasing with depth. Typical detection limits for OJ are in the 0.1 to 1 atomic percent range. How exactly does the OJ emission process work? A primary electron beam with sufficient kinetic energy bombards an atom and leads to the ejection of a core shell electron. The energy of this ionized atom is reduced 
by an electron falling into the initial hole from a less tightly bound state, and by a second electron being emitted from the same or another, type, or, or another less tightly bound state. The kinetic energy of the emitted Auger electron is given by E sub X minus E sub Y minus E sub Z minus phi. Uh, where X, Y, and Z represent the three subshells involved in the OJ emission process. In the example shown in the diagram, this would be the K, L, and L shells, uh, respectively. Phi in the equation represents the work, func work function of the analyzer. Although calculating the kinetic energy of the OJ electron seems relatively straightforward, Energy shifts are expected anytime there's a charge transfer from one atom to another. In ionic bonding, the net electron transfer causes core level electrons of electronegative elements to shift to lower bi binding energies and those of electropositive elements to shift to higher binding energies. The result is often a shift of several electron volts in the OJ peaks compared to their zero valence states. Furthermore, when you have two core holes involved, such as in the OJ process, the screening electrons are drawn inward, and this further complicates the OJ process. Suffice, suffice it to say that while an energy shift of a few electron volts away from the elemental standard would be of great importance in XPS, it leaves the OJ analyst rather unconcerned. Chemical environment also affects OJ line shapes. The relationship between line shape and distribution of electrons in the valence band is complicated because some materials exhibit quasi-atomic spectra and others exhibit band-like spectra. For example, in the case of elemental aluminum versus aluminum oxide, there there's a distinct difference in the line shape of the high energy transition. Elemental aluminum has an asymmetric peak-to-peak -peak structure with significant ringing present in the spectrum. Well, as a, whereas aluminum oxide, on the other hand, has a symmetric peak shape with minimal ringing. As mentioned previously, OJ spectra are subject to large backgrounds, and they consist mostly of backscattered and inelastically scattered electrons. This can result in relatively small OJ peaks compared to the background signal. But we can do a type of automatic background subtraction uh, by looking at the first derivative of the spectrum. In the example of copper, we can see very weak signal intensity in the original spectrum. But in the copper um, derivative spectrum, the MNN and LMM peaks are greatly enhanced. In order to accurately quantify elements in the OJ spectrum, we must first know something about the primary electron beam current, the OJ transition probability, number of electrons in level X, ionization cross-section for electrons in level X for incoming electrons of energy E0 and angle alpha, additional ionization due to backscattering of incident electrons, atomic density, elastic scattering of OJ electrons on their way to the surface, and inelastic mean free path. Clearly, quantification is not straightforward. An alternative semi-quantitative approach is to use sensitivity factors and reference spectra present in the OJ handbook provided by physical electronics. It's important to note that materials with little binding state effects produce accurate quantitative determinations, typically within plus or minus about 10% of actual concentrations. But in ionic compounds, larger errors are possible. And in these cases, or when a more favorable accuracy is required, a more effective approach would involve the use of standards. Here's a graph showing all of the relative sensitivity factors for the major OJ transitions for all 81 elements uh, present in our handbook. And again, all of this data is available in the handbook and it's also integrated into our multi-pack software for automated software dri driven quantification. Here's a schematic comparing AES to other common analysis techniques. Clearly, we see that it has a smaller spot size compared to other surface sensitive techniques such as XPS and TOF SIMS, and it's much more surface sensitive than Raman EDS or FTIR. 
We will now discuss the hardware components present in an AES instrument. First, we'll discuss electron source and detector hardware. Since its early inception, AES has undergone several major hardware advancements. In the early days, a tungsten filament was used, which allowed the beam to be focused to down, say, a micron or so. And the introduction of the Lab 6 filament reduced the beam size to the order of about 100 nanometers or less. Today, we use a shot key thermal field emission electron source, and the current beam size specification, specification is about 4 nanometers. Detector hardware has also evolved over the years. Today, we use high gain micro channel plate detectors, which offer much higher sensitivities than their channel tron predecessors. When it comes to analyzer hardware, there are two major types of analyzers that really dominate the market today. The first is the, is the cylindrical mirror analyzer, or CMA, which operates by allowing the, elect the electrons from the sample to travel through an aperture into the space between an inner and an outer cylinder. The outer cylinder is negatively biased, which causes the electrons to be focused inward as they reach the multi-channel plate detector. The geometry of this analyzer prevents shadowing, which we'll discuss in the next slide, but it needs to be quite close to the sample, which could restrict uh, other beams from accessing the sample. The second type of analyzer um, available is the spherical capacitor analyzer, or SCA. Here, the analyzer is offset from the electron source. Secondary electrons enter the input lens and are slowed down and focused as they reach the hemispherical analyzer. The applied voltage between the concentric spheres serves as, a, as an energy filter for the electrons as they reach the detector. Here's an example of shadowing effects in an SCA versus the CMA. In a CMA, the electron gun is on the same axis as the analyzer, whereas in an SCA, the analyzer is offset from the axis of the electron gun. Although the SCM images obtained from the instruments appear very similar, we can see there's significant shadowing uh, in the SCA OJ image uh, versus the OJ image obtained on a CMA instrument. Another benefit of the CMA over the SCA is that it provides high sens sensitivity at all, all sample tilt angles. The SCA has high sensitivity as the sample is tilted toward the analyzer, but low sensitivity as the sample is tilted away from the analyzer. Because of the coaxial geometry of the CMA analyzer with the electron gun, not only is sensitivity improved, but insulators and samples with high topography are more easily analyzed. Modern instruments are also equipped with a low energy ion source that mitigates charge accumulation on non-conductive surfaces. This works by creating a more uniform surface potential. It can be used on inorganic insulating materials, isolated conductive materials within an insulating matrix, and can also be used for cleaning and sputter depth profiling. Here's an example of the low energy ion source used on a printed circuit board. Here we can see a gold nickel conductive path within an insulating polyimide material. And then in this top SEM image in the corresponding OJ spectrum, we see significant, significant sample charging without neutralization. But on the bottom row, we see that with charge neutralization uh, from our ion gun, the SE image is much more uniform and the OJ spectrum is greatly improved. Several ancillary hardware attachments are also available on modern systems. At PHI, we offer a backscatter electron detector, a sample parking and fracture attachment, an EDS detector, an EBSD detector, and a FIB LMIG gun. We will now discuss the types of data that can be acquired on an OJ system. From AES, you can get SCM images that provide high magnification visualization of the sample. You can also determine which elements are present on the surface and their quantity. You can get two-dimensional elemental distribution with elemental imaging, and we can also get chemical state information for some materials using high energy resolution analysis.
Furthermore, we can sput sputter depth profile uh, to reveal thin film interface composition. Here's a brief example of AES data acquired on a multi-layer metrology standard. You can see the diagram in the top left here. A typical workflow consists of acquiring SEM images first. From here, such as seen in this uh, SEM image in the upper right, we can assign points to uh, different features of interest within the image. We can then take OJ spectra from these points to get qualitative and quantitative elemental analysis. Furthermore, we can create an elemental image based on the elements present in the survey spectrum to get two-dimensional elemental distribution. As mentioned previously, we can also get some chemical state information from OJ as well. This is done using high energy resolution operation or HERO mode. In a typical CMA, the energy resolution is given by the change in energy divided by the energy and is typically around 0.5%. From this simple equation, we can see that if the kinetic energy of the OJ electron is reduced, the energy resolution can be improved. In practice, this is done by placing an optics element between the sample surface and the entrance to the CMA, which slows down the OJ electrons coming from the sample. This requires no modification to the CMA, only the use of a special sample holder, and it's a relatively easy way to improve the energy resolution of the CMA. How is the HERO mode used? Here's an example of a semiconductor bond pad as shown in the SCM image. The silicon OJ map from the same area is seen here in red. In spectral window imaging mode, a silicon spectrum is collected and stored for each pixel in the silicon map. And the high energy silicon OJ spectrum on the right shows the sum of all pixel, pixel spectra present in this OJ image. Within this OJ image, we can see three re regions of interest or ROIs seen in green, black, and blue. Oops. If we extract spectra from these regions of interest, uh, we can see at the bottom that the black region corresponds to silicon as an oxynitride, the blue region corresponds to silicon as a metal, and the green region corresponds to silicon as a silicide. Using these three spectra as basis spectra, we can get chemical state maps of the bond pad. Here we show the SEM image, and an image of the sum of the total silicon signal from the area. And from this high resolution uh, energy spectrum, we can extract maps of silicon as a silicide, silicon as a metal, and silicon as an oxynitride. If we do a color overlay of these three images, we get the image here, which is a chemical state map of silicon obtained at high spatial resolution. We can also get depth profiling information with OJ spectroscopy. For some samples, it's important to rotate the sample while sputtering. Here is a bond pad seen before sputtering. And if we sputter using copycentric Zillar rotation, the surface topography is mostly maintained and the aluminum grains are eas easily distinguished. But without Zillar rotation, uh, you can see some sputtering artifacts. The depth profile of the rotated sample shows there is a thin layer of aluminum oxide present at the sample surface, and we can see a sharp aluminum silicon interface. Meanwhile, in the stationary sample, we see little surface oxide and a broad aluminum silicon interface. We will now give a few brief examples of OJ applications. The first example is of an alumina supported silver catalyst. The left column of images is from a fresh catalyst. The right column is from an aged catalyst and the top uh, SEM images are at a 10 micron field of view. Below that, we have the corresponding silver, aluminum and cesium maps. From these images, we can see that the silver catalyst uh, particles have agglomerated after the catalyst has been aged. The alumina support particles have remained roughly the same size, and the cesium remains dispersed after aging, but appears to have increased in concentration. 
Taking a closer look at the cesium map of the aged catalyst, we can see several hot spots of high cesium concentration. Inter interestingly, in this particular hot spot of cesium, if we zoom in and collect a survey spectrum at this spot, we also detect significant concentration of rhenium, which was not detected in the larger 10 micron field of view survey scan. If we zoom in on this hot spot of cesium that we saw on the previous slide, we can see the SEM image on the left and a high spatial resolution image of the cesium region in the middle. On the right, we have a rhenium map, which shows the spatial correlation of rhenium with cesium in this region. Our second OJ analysis application example is on a magnetoresistive head. The magnetoresistive element is located within an insulating aluminum material. As you can see here on the SEM image, we have the magnetoresistive element here and the alumina support matrix on the outside. In the OJ color overlay map, we see this magnetoresistive area consists of tantalum, which is represented in red. This magnetoresistive uh, tantalum area is surrounded on both sides by a thin alumina layer, which is then surrounded by the bottom shield and shared pole consisting of nickel. And finally, it is embedded in more alumina. We can zoom in further to get high resolution SEM image of this magnetoresistive region. This SEM image shows that the region consists of a fine layered structure. We can take a line scan across this fine layer structure, which collects OJ data at up to 1,024 points along this line. If we then plot the intensity of the detected elements versus the distance across the line, we see the structure is quite complex. So here we can see how OJ can identify fine layer structures at the nanoscale of a conductive material embedded within an insulating support. One of the hot topics lately in semiconductor device manufacturing is area selective deposition, which is used to pattern features with sub 10 nanometer resolution. This is done by a series of atomic layer deposition and atomic layer etching steps. Ideally, as the number of deposition and etching cycles increases, materials can be grown with precise dimensions in the nanoscale. One of the failure mechanisms of this process, however, is growth that can happen in non-growth regions. In this example here, a low temperature isothermal ALD ALE uh, supercycle uh, setup was employed to um, grow titanium dioxide on silicon silicon dioxide pattern surfaces. To study the limits of this process, samples were created intentionally to show selectivity loss. So OJ analysis of the sample shows some particles present in the non-growth region as seen in these SEM images. And we would like to um, characterize these defect particles. EDS analysis of these particles was inconclusive. In the EDS maps, we can see relatively uniform distributions of titanium and silicon. However, the OJ maps clearly show distinct titanium particles amongst the silicon substrate. Here we show data taken at a smaller field of view of these defect particles. We can collect point spectra from the particles and get chemical identification and quantification of the particles. Here we've taken points one and two on particles and points three and four off particles. We can see in the corresponding OJ spectra from these points as well as the uh, atomic concentrations that in this case, the defect particles have higher concentrations of titanium, oxygen, and carbon compared to the regions off the particles. Furthermore, we can take a line scan of the titanium intensity across the field of view of the map to obtain particle size measurements. Here we show that we're able to distinguish a 10 nanometer particle in the titanium map. The last couple of examples show how OJ can be used together uh, with other attachments available on the system for complementary analysis. Here we have a manganese sulfide inclusion within a carbon steel sample that was first observed by SEM and analyzed by EDS. 
the EDS data indicates that the particle uniquely contains manganese and sulfur. An OJ uh, spectrum acquired from this particle also detects copper present on the surface, which was not present in the EDS spectrum. OJ maps of the particle show co-localized regions of manganese, sulfur, and copper. A depth profile was then obtained to detect how thick the copper layer was in the manganese sulfide inclusion. The depth profile shows that the thickness of the copper layer is about 12 nanometers, which explains why the EDS could not detect the copper initially. EDS has a much deeper analysis depth than OJ, and the thin copper layer on the surface would be overwhelmed by the larger analysis volume of EDS. So although EDS is useful for quick detection and identification of near surface features, OJ provides the complementary information of fine surface structure. On this same carbon steel sample, a different manganese sulfide inclusion was located by SEM EDS. Interestingly, the sulfur OJ map shows a different distribution of sulfur than the sulfur EDS map. The OJ map shows this sort of plume of sul sulfur on the surface, and this is reflected in the SEM image, but not detected in the EDS sulfur map, which indicates that the plume is located at the sample surface. We can also collect in situ EBSD maps in order to show grain boundaries and strain fields, which can help predict where localized corrosion could take place in the future. The next example is that of a buried particle within a titanium zirconium passivated aluminum sample. The particle was first observed by some EDS, and the EDS map of the region shows that the particle contains iron. However, if we take an OJ spectrum from the same particle, uh, we detect no iron. So to get, a, to get an idea of the 3D composition of the particle, an in-situ fib cut was made. Here in the SEM uh, image, you can see the fib cut through the middle of the particle. And we can acquire an OJ spectrum from the uh, freshly exposed fib face. And we can see in the OJ spectrum that we do uh, detect iron on the fib face. The OJ map shows that the iron particle is platelet shaped and located just beneath the sample surface. This example shows how first we needed EDS to detect the particle in the first place, but then we needed FIB and high resolution OJ mapping uh, to determine the true structure of the particle. Our final OJ application example is of a 3D printing powder consisting of copper, chromium, and zirconium. These types of materials are of significant interest lately in the field of additive manufacturing. The macroscopic analysis of the powder showed that it contained 0.7% chromium and 0.09% zirconium and trace amounts of iron, silicon, and oxygen. We wanted to take a look at potential grain boundary diffusion within these powder particles. So here we have a 47 micron diameter particle seen in this SCM image. A fib cut was made through the particle to expose the grain boundaries within. And these SCM images show how we zoomed in on one of the grain boundaries to take OJ maps. The OJ maps, as you can see here, we have the copper, oxygen, chromium, and zirconium maps. And we can clearly see how oxygen, chromium, and zirconium have segregated to and concentrated at the grain boundaries. This type of analysis could link grain boundary diffusion to the solidification speed of the various particle sizes. In summary, today we've discussed how OJ electron spectroscopy is a powerful surface analytical analysis technique because it can provide elemental composition and quantification at high spatial resolution. The information it provides about surfaces, nanostructures, and thin films plays a critical role in many industrial and uh, research applications. A few of those applications we've looked at today, but of course there are many more. <laughs>